Hello, everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk right here on this special Monday edition. Why is it special? We're not in a cave. We are actually in New York <laughs> City right now, and we'll get into all the details about why. First, I want to introduce everybody standing with me. We got Christian Harloff over here. We are in a secret base. Tell Mon Mothma where the plans are. <laughs> Over here, Mark Ellis. Live from New York, it's Mark and Ken. And of course, Kenny Zock. Uh, Ken Knapsack is here. I'm here, I'm uh, freezing. I don't have earmuffs, but I'm going to be talking movies. Okay, so uh, as I kind of mentioned, we are actually, this is not a regular movie talk. This is not live, so there are no live Twitter questions today. But we are in New York City. Uh, me, the guys here, almost the entire Collider crew, we're here in New York right now because we're here for some company meetings and stuff like that. But we're here for a few days. We thought, you know what, we don't want to go without Movie Talk, so we thought we'd do it from here at the Complex Studios. We are in Rockefeller Plaza, actually. In, as Ken would put it a little bit earlier, we're in the shadow of 30 Rock. We've got, mm -hmm. uh, like, we're right in the heart of downtown here. So I wanted to point out that since this is not live uh, and we're not doing it from our regular studio, don't hold us to any particular standards, if you will, uh, for today's show. But we do have a bunch of stuff to talk about today. So, uh, Mark, you're going to be our Ashley Mova for the day. Yes, sir, John. Breaking news. It's 25 degrees, and this is the warmest thing I brought to New York City. <laughs> been fun so far. Uh, we also have the box office report. It is Monday, so it is time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. The Force is strong with Disney and Lucasfilm as Rogue One, a Star Wars story, opened as the second best December opening of all time time with $155 million, that's the number one spot at the domestic box office, and $290.5 million globally, which is also the second highest opening in December behind The Force Awakens. Disney also scored with Moana, which took the number two spot with $11.66 million. That's got a domestic total of $161.86 million so far. Office Christmas Party came in at number three with $8.5 million in its second week of release. Collateral Beauty opened not so well with $7 million from over three thousand theaters for the number four spot and at number five was Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them which grabbed another five million dollars to add to its domestic total of two hundred and seven million dollars. John, were you surprised at all that Rogue One performed so well at the box office? I think I originally predicted 147. Mm -hmm. I think 147 was my original prediction but we said let's wait to see what the buzz is like after some people actually see it. We did and then I I think I changed my estimate to like 151. So I, w I took the plus, I took the over on the 150 thing. Not surprised at all. Look, if you take out its Star Wars brethren, you take out its own films, in this case, The Force Awakens, this is the number one release. That no other film in Hollywood history outside of the Star Wars franchise has ever debuted this much in December. That says something. For them, you know, Bob Iger called this a risk. He called Rogue One a risk. And it was a bit of a risk. But at a $155 million opening weekend, it was a risk well worth it. I mean, I've, we knew it wasn't going to be an episodic kind of number. We knew it wasn't going to be episode seven numbers. We knew we know episode eight is going to do better because this is an outside of the box. There was some confusion from a lot of people out there still. So I think this is a fantastic result. Everybody's thrilled with it. The one thing to me that I'm a little bit surprised about is Collateral Beauty. Now, if you saw my review of it, you know it's not that good of a film. You know, I said that, but I thought... Will Smith, Ed Norton, Kira Knightley, like, uh, like that cast alone, and I thought the trailers looked pretty good. I did expect it to make like 15 to 20. Mm -hmm. even, and it was good counter-programming. On its surface, Collateral Beauty is good counter-programming to a Star Wars film. I thought it might have done sisters kind of numbers. It did not. I guess word got out about how poor it was. But Collateral Beauty, that is the one that really stands out to me about how poorly it performed. What about you, Christian? Yeah, Collateral Beauty, because to quote the great Jar Jar Binks, P.U.S.A. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's bad. I mean, if you, yeah. I think this has got to be Will Smith next to After Earth. It's got to be one of the lowest openings for his career, right? I think his lowest opening was $10 million for concussion okay, so uh, this, last year. Yeah. You see, I, I don't agree on the kind of programming because the thing is with sisters, right? That's a comedy. You know, the the, mm, the, the yeah. feel good. You can go and see. It. I didn't love sisters, but I understood that because that's completely different. As where you look, the, Rogue One could be us. Yeah, it's sci-fi fantasy, but it's also it's got a lot of dramatic elements. It's a drama. So is Collateral, Be Collateral Beauty in different ways, absolutely. But I don't think people are going to rush out if you have an option of Star Wars, and that's what you want to see. Let me go see a, a potential d depressing movie with Will Smith. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I, so that's the one where I'm gonna. S 
it was a bad choice to put it out at that time. It should have probably come out in January or February. They should have pushed it. Maybe they're trying to get the Oscar. It doesn't seem. And the critic response has been, it's kind of like 13% or something. Yeah, it was overwhelmingly negative. So that's one. Rogue One to me, I also, I think opening, I had it about 150. And then after the buzz, I went higher. I think I went like 170 or something because already I know people that have seen it two or three times already. And I think that the second week, I don't think the drop is going to be that big next week. It's probably like like 50, maybe if I say 50, 60 percent. But it's going to be, um, it's a December opening, like you said before, before The Force Awakens, no movie had ever cracked 100. Star Wars owns the real estate in December, yeah. and this just keeps that. I think that just, it should start, I think Solo should move to December. I think Star Wars should own December. I did $155 million to me. When I first saw it, I was a little disappointed. I mean, I had this thing, like you, I was getting caught up in the high and everybody saying it's such a good movie. So I was thinking it could be up to $180, $185 million. So just to see $155 disappoints me. But then when I investigated the numbers a little bit more, when you realize how they marketed this movie, and they were really trying to separate this from the episodic films, I didn't think the marketing did a great job for this movie. I, agree. I didn't think some of the posters were all that good or some of the billboards. I thought a lot of the commercials lent to confusion for the lay person as to being like, where exactly does this movie fit in? But for what this film ended up being, such an inside baseball kind of Star Wars movie where it catered more to the hardcore fan. Seeing that $155 million really stands out to me in a positive way. And I agree with you guys on Collateral Beauty. I think that that movie was so pushing to get an Oscar nomination that they forgot to market it the way you should market that movie because when you and watch the trailer... they forgot to make a good movie. They, it, <laughs> I didn't a, hate the movie. I, was, I, I thought it was okay, but I thought it was going to be a lot more emotional. Like yeah. watching it, I, they market it like it's going to be this huge tearjerker. It didn't end up being that for me. So I think you could have put a little bit of rainbows and sunshine in the trailer without hurting the movie. Do you know what? Hey, I, I got an idea. I want to throw this out there. Hindsight. On all the posters, a little tagline on the Rogue One poster should have been, Before There Was Hope. Huh? Oh. 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 Look at that Before big the, marketing uh, brain on yeah. Campia. Yeah, I'm always, I come up with the great ideas when it's five <laughs> days too late all the time. Yeah. Okay, Ken, what, what stands out to you about the box office? Well, report? I had predicted like 192 based on my ticket sales. So, <laughs> uh, I kind of consider this a failure. But no, you know what's interesting though? Uh, I saw it, at, I have seen it three times. I uh, saw it at a couple different theaters. And at one of the theaters, I won't say which one, um, uh, had the only showings available on the weekend were Rogue One and La La Land. That's the only wow. movies showing in that theater. Yet the theater didn't have one Rogue One poster, uh, costume, any kind of the normal really? kind of big marketing. Hmm. It was kind of so it was big and available, but it was also kind of under the radar screen. And I have gotten text and messages from a lot of people who've watched a lot of Star Wars films who are still like, "But I have a question about this." Mm. So th it's an interesting thing. It is a risk, uh, but I think overall you have to consider it a success, and we're going to get a lot more Star Wars anthology films, as, as, as they should, because I think uh, December is now the place for Star Wars, and that's interesting. Uh, as far as the other stuff, uh, you know, Office Christmas Party would be good counter-programming to me, right. but uh, right. that, you know, did what it was supposed to do, right. I think. so. But Rogue One, 155, still impressive. Do not uh, discount that number. I am really curious, though, and Christian brought it up, what the second weekend drop-off is going to be, because I think it's going to be around 60%, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, for a movie that opens that big is not the worst thing to ever happen, but I hope it doesn't fall off a cliff and get up to, like, 70%, which I think is in play. No, I, I don't think it'll be 70 but that is the one thing. Normally we say that the, the line you want to look at is 50%. You, you, right around 50% is good. You don't want to go too far below that. But when when you get a movie like this that makes 155 million opening weekend, one of the things that tells you is that there were people were not waiting for the second or third week to go see this. When you get a number like 155 million, that means most of the people who were wanting to see this movie went out to see it opening weekend. So that's why you start looking at 50 to 60 percent might be an acceptable range. Keep this in mind too. We've got like four or five major films releasing between now and Friday. That includes. Assassin's Creed, which sucks, by the way. We've got <laughs> Passengers, which is, we'll go into Assassin's Creed more Should later. they put that on the Assassin's Creed yeah. poster? <laughs> it sucks, by the way, right. John um, We've got Passengers, which is uh, apparently not as bad as we thought it might turn out to be. I've heard it was terrible. Really? Because I've heard mixed things. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. were in office yeah. saying it wasn't passengers. that bad. Passengers. We've heard It's got like 12% of Rotten Tomatoes. We've got Sing, which is not that good, but a kid's animated film. We've got the comedy Why Him, which it was a lot better than I thought I it was going to be. Gonna do, I think that is going to do, I think that's going to, I think that's going to be this year's sisters. So I yeah, think it's going to surprise so, people. So now you got Rogue One that's in there. It's going into the second week, and it's got Why Him, Assassin's Creed, Passengers, Sing. Yeah. You got the autopsy of Jane Doe, which on a smaller number of screens. So I think 60% is in play. I'd be surprised if it was 70, but 60% I think is in play. 
All right, what's next? Uh, next up is a minor spoiler alert, possibly, as we discuss Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Though production on the fifth film has been done for a while now, it appears there is one more addition to the cast that has not been reported. According to 2Fab, via a report from Slash Film, Kieran Knightley has secretly joined the cast, reprising her role as Elizabeth for some scenes. The movie sees the return of Johnny Depp as Captain Sparrow, along with Orlando Bloom's Will Turner. They will be joined by Javier Bardem, who is cast as the new villain. The movie is set for release on May 26, 2017. Christian George, what do you think of the report that Kira Knightley is returning for a fifth Pirates film? I, I, I believe that that's going to happen, and I think that it should, and I think that it also makes sense when you come to the fifth film, and she hasn't been in it for a little bit. She was part of the magic of the first uh, three, even though I thought the first one was really the one with any magic in it, but as far as box office might concern, people did like that original trilogy. Bring her back, um, and I also think that it takes the focus off of just having Sparrow as the main guy. He's a good back character. He's a guy that you don't have to rely on him being the main character. For what I liked about that first movie with with Sparrow was that he was essentially kind of the Han Solo of, of the film, if you will, because that way you rely on him for that kind of, the guy who shouldn't be the main protagonist. And she it really was. was kind of a Will Turner movie, the first one, right. wasn't it? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he so, was the Luke. Yeah, and then now you bring her back, it ties it together, it t again, takes the focus off just Sparrow, and I want to see more what she's, what this character's going to do. I hope they develop it a little bit more. So I like the fact she's come back, and I've always been a fan of Keira Knightley, so I like it. What do you think? You know what, I, I like the first movie too, and this makes sense on paper, get the team back together, but we're in New York, I'm a lifelong New York fan, Yankee fan. Uh, uh, the 1996 Yankees brought together people and won a World's Championship, the 2005 Yankees put big money to big names people remembered and put them on the team and didn't nope. win. I think this is a franchise that's listing and I think this is kind of a let's bring back all right. the things. That's when Tino came back. It's, it's exactly. <laughs> Tino came back from his uh, Tampa Bay trip and um, uh, it's interesting on paper but I think for me this franchise has sailed. Oh! oh I and we're like out. That. Yeah. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> All right, Mark. Uh, I don't have any taglines as good as what Kenny just dropped, but I will tell you that I think Kira Knightley's addition to this movie, it's I can't imagine she has that big of a role. If 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 they are she secretly added into scenes or she just stopped in to shoot a couple scenes, I think we would have already heard about it. She was one of the big stars of the movie. So I hope what you guys are saying is that Will Turner is going to be more of the star of this movie than what Johnny Depp is going to be. That's what I hope to see. Is he Orlando Bloom? I say, oh, sorry, he is, he's definitely in Orlando the Orlando Bloom is in this, okay, yeah. See. yeah. Yeah, so they're both returning, but yeah. I think with Orlando Bloom's character, he's more essential to whatever story they're going to tell. Look, the bottom line is that I think Keira Knightley is going to be a solid addition to this. It doesn't make me necessarily want to go see the movie more, but I don't need to after seeing that trailer and seeing what Javier Bardem is hopefully going to be bringing to the table. That's what's selling me on this movie. Yeah, it's, it's funny because we were just talking about Collateral Beauty and it was a bit of a disappointment. I, I actually thought Keira Knightley was great in the film. She's always I thought good. She, you know, she's yeah. always good. She's always great. But this is no surprise because look, as soon as that first trailer dropped and you saw uh, wh what is the villain's name again? Balthazar? Sal Salazar? Uh, whatever. Salazar, Balthazar Getty's back? Yeah. Yeah. Balthazar <laughs> Getty. Yeah. Salazar and he goes and he's talking to that kid in the cage. Everybody instantly assumed, oh that's that's Will and Elizabeth's kid. And so that was the assumption I think a lot of yeah. the fans were making. So the idea that both uh, of them were, would right. be back is really not that big of a stretch. I completely agree with you. I love the Captain Jack character. I do. But he worked best in the first one when he was either coing or playing second fiddle yeah. a little bit. He's that great character to play there. Ever since they moved him front and center, the films have failed. And I'm not saying the films have failed. I mean, financially, they have not failed. They've been huge box office smashes. But ever since they moved him to the lead character, it, it, the stories don't flow as well. It doesn't work quite as well. It would be interesting to see if, if they ever try to break away from that, but because of the box office, they never will. As long as they're making Captain, Captain Jack movies, as long as they're <laughs> making Pirates of the Caribbean movies, they're going to be Captain Jack movies because that's what draws in the dollars, regardless of whether or not the movie's any good. So that's always been a little bit of a problem. We'll continue to be. You know what's funny right now? Just a little inside baseball for you guys. Normally when we do this show, uh, in our own studio, we have a monitor right here, so I can look down at the monitor and see what's on screen. And I keep finding myself looking into the light. <laughs> Instead of a monitor, we've got a big light right here, and I find myself keep, keep looking over to it, and I'm not. Stay away away from the light, John. Right. All right, we're gonna do buy and sell. What's up, Mark? Uh, it's buy or sell, John, and this is the part of the show where <laughs> I'm gonna corrected. present you boys with a topic, and you simply say whether you buy it or sell it, and then you argue your decision to the death. The Hollywood Reporter reports that two years after principal photography was completed on the disaster movie Geostorm. The film is going back for reshoots. The Skydance production stars Gerard Butler and would have marked the directorial debut of Independence Day co-writer and producer Dean Devlin. Devlin was replaced with Judge Dredd director, not Dredd director, mm, Judge mm. 
Red director Danny Cannon for the reshoots on the movie that is about Butler. Stop laughing until I'm finished. It's about Butler going into space in order to prevent a climate controlling satellite from creating a man made storm of epic proportions while also trying to stop an assassination attempt on the President of the United States. <laughs> Whew. It is slated for release on October 20th, 2017 and cannot get here fast enough. <laughs> Kenny, do you buy or sell the reshoots and, and whether they're going to help Geostorm box off <laughs> I, I sold simply because after you said two years after principal photography, I tuned out. Because no. if a movie isn't released two years after principal photography, there is problems. And the while also in that plot point there... <laughs> Uh, might make me want to buy again, actually. I'm kind of in the middle. Can I push? Can I put this on layaway? I don't know. Because this seems like something where you want to uh, uh, drink and watch and have fun. But I'm going to sell whatever's going on there. I Yeah, look. There, there are reshoots of big blockbusters that are part of the planned production when they plan to shoot. T step back, take a breath, review what they've done, get better ideas, and go back in. They budget for it. They, they schedule for it. And this is something different. I mean, you're talking about two years later, and you're switching directors, and this sounds like, okay, he's trying, he goes into space. Stop this satellite, and trying to stop it. What was the name of the Ben Stiller fake trailers? Yeah, that's exactly in, what I was saying. What's a no. scorcher? Yeah, no, it's a yeah. scorcher. Exactly yeah. what it's, it's, it feels, sounds like a scorcher. Yeah. This sounds ridiculous. I sell everything about this. It's like they say, like, hey, guys, how <laughs> bad can we make this? <laughs> Not only are we going to make a bad and stupid movie, but let's get the worst team possible. <laughs> hey, what about the, how about, who should we get to direct the Dread Guy? That was a good one. No, no, no. The Judge <laughs> Dread Guy. Why not just put Rob Schneider in the lead? What is Butler doing? Butler is good. What is he associated I with? I like this team? him a lot. He's great. I love Butler. Why is he associated with this team? It's like, the one thing that he did great recently was when he dropped out of the Point Break remake. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Drop out of this! Even if you've shot everything, just you know, tell them that they have to do Rogue One stuff and, and stick your face <laughs> out of there and put someone else in there. Put Rob Snyder's face on your body. <laughs> it is, this is so you stupid. You can do it! It's amazing how bad this is. They should just say, and then he fights a giant tomato at the end. It's like, <laughs> it is that stupid. It is, this is the, one of the worst sounding movies I've ever heard in my life and it is going to be one of the biggest bombs of all time. It's Pluto Nash style. This is horrible. Okay, so we have two sells, we yeah. have a push, Big and the sell. biggest buy in the history of buys. <laughs> I cannot wait to see this movie. Would I you need pay for this, though? Yes, no, I you would, would pay not. To, I no. would pay $20 to go see this. You know what? You're also, also, also. I admit, morbid curiosity. I'm probably there opening but you would night. Pay, well, see, you would pay to I'm, see I'm, I might be there opening night. The money. Morbid thinking, curiosity. Did someone create a snowstorm to kill the president with the yes! snowstorm? <laughs> yes! I changed mine yes! to buy! It's, 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 <laughs> it's like the dumbest Bond movie premise of all time. But, and you put it into a movie where... I, here, let me, let me defend my buy here a little bit. Because <laughs> according to these notes, Jerry Brockheimer is brought on as a consultant and he suggested the reshoots. Jerry Brockheimer has produced a lot of silly, fun popcorn action hits, okay? Suggested the reshoots means... The, the, this movie is shit. The, the reshoots yeah. reportedly are costing up to fifteen million dollars, so that's definitely sig <laughs> significant. <laughs> There's a brand new scientist. The production character. alone is a disaster movie. <laughs> the, the, the the writer of Shutter Island is coming in for the reshoots. Wow. This is gonna be. You so see, there's a good. new scientist character. There's a new scientist. Please character. tell me who Denise played Richards. Denise Richards. Please, please, please tell me Denise Richards. Doctor Christmas. Please. Did Brooke Heimer look at the shots and went? That's yeah, not good. Right. <laughs> not again. Right. Imagine so when this trailer thing drops. I want to do the reaction. If, if it was one thing, if you told me like Matthew Vaughn or somebody along that was directing this big, stupid, silly yeah. thing, but then when you see, they don't know who they, they're. When was the last time that that guy directed a movie? It's probably. It, I mean, even the name Geostorm just sounds like. It sounds, it like, sounds a like a kids' adventure new, magazine. It sounds like a new Ford car. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the new Ford Geostorm. Yeah. Like, a crossover with Spy Kids it's 6. Seats one and a half people. And, <laughs> <laughs> and a new scientist character can fit in the back. All oh right. Oh, my God. What's next? Uh, next up is a new international trailer. Just debuted for Ghost in the Shell. Based on the internationally acclaimed sci-fi property, the movie follows the Major, played by Scarlett Johansson, a special ops human cyborg who leads the elite task force Section 9. Ghost in the Shell arrives in theaters on March 31st, 2017. John, do you buy or sell the new international trailer for Ghost in the Shell? I sell it simply on the basis there's nothing in this trailer we haven't seen before, except for some uh, superscript over top. That's that's it. I mean, there's nothing new in this, so I don't see why uh, why people are making a deal about it for so for me to sell. I mean, I'll buy it because I like what's in it, but yeah, I'll sell it the fact that I, I didn't learn anything new that I had gotten before, but I'm going to buy that I'm getting excited about this movie. I want to see what they're going to do with this film, and it's like basically what I wanted out of Anne Flux that I never got. 
Um, this oh, is man, you know, it was so bad that movie. But this this could be something really cool. Uh, if I Kenny and I had a bet that somebody was going to drop Aeon Flux, I would have <laughs> lost that bet here <laughs> on Movie Talk. Um, I'll buy it for the same reason. Where you're right, we didn't get to see a lot of new stuff, but I like everything this movie is showing us so far. Even though it does lack uh, climate change, uh, man-made uh, <laughs> weapons that are going to be tomato, destroying Earth, that, there is a giant tomato at the end of this movie. I'm going to buy the trailer because I like what I see so far. Yeah, I'm still going to buy it. Uh, I am not so familiar with the property that uh, I'm still kind of watching this, going, what, what am I? Saying it's kind of intriguing. I know there's the controversy going into the production of the movie, um, but I, you got some beautiful visuals here. Uh, yeah, the trailer itself, maybe nothing new, but the concept, I'm still gonna buy it. All right, what's next? Next up, Variety reports that Oscar nominees Jonah Hill and Rooney Mara are in talks to join Joaquin Phoenix in Gus Van Zandt's new biopic about the quadriplegic cartoonist John Callahan. Based off the bio, don't worry, he won't get far on foot. Phoenix will play Callahan, a controversial figure who became paralyzed following a car accident at the age of 21. He turned to drawing as a form of therapy, and when his cartoons started appearing in the Portland newspaper Willamette Week, the town reacted with boycotts and protests. Christian, do you buy or sell the addition of Jonah Hill and Rooney Mara in the new Gus Van Sant biopic? Ah, that's a big buy for me. I love this cast. These are all actors and actresses that I've been following over the last couple of years that have just been knocking it out of the park. And Joaquin Phoenix is just one of those guys that you just want to see what he's going to do next yeah. because he's just, he might be. He, you know, it's controversial sometimes, and he's and he's a bit out there, but I think that's what makes him so great, and this is a perfect kind of role for him. Rooney Mara is one of my favorite actors today, and Jonah Hill is becoming a guy for me, and it's so funny because when we started reviewing movies, I was sick of Jonah Hill with comedy because he was doing the same shtick, and then he just shifted, man. He's another guy that shows, like, that. what was the one that he just, uh, War Dogs. War Dogs. He was really good really in that. Good in Wolf that, of yeah. Wall Street, Moneyball, that dude just goes for it. And so this is a great cast. The only the one that concerns me the most honestly is Gus Van Zandt because Goodwill Hunting is one of my favorites of all time. His last couple movies just haven't been on par with a lot of the stuff that he's done in the past. But this type of story with what he's done in the past as a director with this cast is something I'm very intrigued by so it's a big buy for me. Yeah, I mean you would hope that this is where he gets back to those goodwill hunting kind of days where I think he can too because this clearly seems like a passion project for him and Joaquin Phoenix. You know he's going to commit 100% to this and we don't know what roles Jonah Hill and Rooney Mara are going to be playing in this story so you really just have to judge it on the basis of their talents involved and I think they both are very versatile. Jonah Hill a little more sneaky versatile than Rooney Mara, than Rooney Mara is but I think this is a great call. I'm excited to see this movie now. Yeah, this is, uh, I'll, I'll buy it based on the, the, the cast, the ingredients going into this soup here, so to speak. Uh, it's so interesting. Yeah, Jonah Hill, go back to, you know, 40 year old version, yeah. the first time he emerges on screen. Mm -hmm. Super large, funny scene, and it's a testament to how you can grow your career. What's also interesting, sneak in your notes here because I have the opportunity. <laughs> this, that Amazon Studios is kind of looking to maybe be the leader to get the distribution on this film. And the fact that Amazon, where I used to buy books and comic books and stuff, is now in Oscar races with yeah. Manchester by the Sea. What a weird time. We, we live in, but it's wonderful. Yeah. But look, when you talk about the subject matter, the talent involved, and you know, I know Gus Van Sant is a concern for you, but him with somebody like Joaquin Phoenix, yeah, that's why I'm guy, buying it. Yeah. With this kind of a subject matter, mm -hmm. to me, this is really interesting. So for me, it's a buy. All right, what's next? You got some competition, Geo Storm, because a new trailer has been released <laughs> for Triple X. Turn of Xander oh. Cage, directed by DJ Caruso. The film stars Vin Diesel, Ruby Rose, Nina Dobrev, Tony Collette, Donnie Yen, and Samuel L. Jackson. It is set for release on January 20th, 2017. Ken, do you buy or sell the new trailer for Triple X The Return of Xander Cage? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the names in the cast make you think, bye. I saw the first Triple X in the theater, and it was popcorn fun. I can get behind it, second one and everything. But then you see the trailer, and I got to sell, because is this like deleted scenes from Fast 7? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Like, I, it just looks like the same stuff retread. I get it, business-wise, and, and with that uh, diverse international cast, it's probably going to do good money, but I'm, I'm going to sell it. Yeah, I, look, I bought the first trailer for this movie, just because it looked like ridiculous popcorn mm -hmm. fun. This trailer's just horrible. I mean, it's really just bad. And I think the novelty of, hey, good popcorn, f I think that's starting to wear off and we're starting to smell, smell the stench. Mm -hmm. It's starting to come yeah. through. I don't have a lot of hope for this movie. This was a terrible trailer. I still stand by the first trailer as just popcorn fun. 
this was just a bad trailer, so for me it's a sell. Uh, it's a sell for me too. I mean, look, I said this when we were reviewing the Fate of the Furious trailer. There's an art to dumb fun. You don't just throw a lot of stuff in a movie and expect it to be a fun action film. There's a there's a, a subtlety to it. There's it, early 90s action movies did it so well and they're trying to emulate that and make it huge and over the top, but they're not doing it in the right way, at least in my opinion. I thought this trailer was a huge misfire. With this cast involved, this should be a really fun action movie. I think it's just going to be so stupid and over the top, it's going to take the enjoyment out of it for me. It was atrocious. It was <laughs> so stupid because the problem is, and it's a huge sell, obviously, um, <laughs> my, because the problem, the problem is Fast and Furious was able to do something. We've talked about it on the show many times. When it turned it around, you think in four, I think in five is when it really turned mm -hmm. it around and it became this different type of movie and they carried it over in six and even in seven and hopefully they do it in, in this new one. It is not easy to do that with mm. franchises. And now he's trying to do it again in this one, and it's the same guy that's doing it, and he doesn't look any different from Dom. It's the same character, and he's breaking machine guns open with his hands with his superhero now. It's it's like, it, it looks so dumb. And not in the way that Fast and Furious does, because Fast and Furious, I'm already invested in how silly it is. Now, every movie that Vin Diesel is in, now I'm supposed to just accept this silly over the top thing. Pick a franchise, which is the one that I'm supposed to go that's the silly. Every movie he's in is in the silly action vein, and he's no different. He's just Vin Diesel now. He's not like Dom had certain thing. Who is this guy, Alexander Cage? What's the this, this movie sucks. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. But if I look at it, <laughs> tell us how you really feel. <laughs> is on paper, I like this. I like the cast, and I like that it's coming out in January. I want a fun action movie like that in January. And for Vin Diesel's career, it makes all the sense in the world because if you have the Fast and Furious movies that are going to dominate April from now on, then you have another action franchise that could potentially be making its way in January, and it's like the new Taken, where you look forward to these movies early in the year. It's just this trailer was just so bad, I can't get excited. January should tell you a lot about this. Yeah. I'm telling you, Jan because that's the thing, if, if they if the studio felt like, wait, this could be another Fast and the Furious, it's not going in January. It's like, let's hope they think it's another Fast and the Furious. We'll put it in January, and if it does really well, then we'll open it in July. This movie's going to tank. It's not like Geostorm, which opens in October, which is an <laughs> Oscar right. kind of movie. Yeah. Alright guys, hey, listen, uh, before we get into our mailbag questions, and by the way, we're going to get to mailbag in just a minute, so if you've got a top topic or question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send them on in. We're going to get to those in a second. I just want to remind you, though, that the latest segment of Collider Crash Course dropped yesterday morning. It is now on our channel. Our very own Ken Napsok walks us through the ray is related to Obi-Wan theory. Ooh. It actually walks it through beautifully about why you should buy into the theory, some reasons why you may not. You'll want to check that out. It's actually a really great video. Check that one out right now. All right, let's get into our mailbag. Up first is the following query from Rick, who writes, Hello, Collider crew. With the release of oh, Rogue Rick. One. <laughs> 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 Rogue One has finally made its way to the masses. One of the more consistent criticisms being heard from otherwise overjoyed fans has concerned the musical score no. feeling too different or at least somewhat off when compared to what we have become accustomed to with John Williams. So I'll pose my question in the form of a would you rather. Would you rather Michael Giacchino given a second chance or see Alexandra Desplat or someone else be given the opportunity? Oh, uh, no, I want to see G Giacchino come back and do this one again only because... When the dude has four to five weeks to score the film, you're not actually getting a real sample of what he can do. Look, just look at Giacchino's other films. This dude is a great composer. He's a wonderful composer. Now, this whole thing about it feels too different, yeah, it felt different, all that kind of stuff, and I know some there's some level at Lucasfilm where they wanted it to feel different, and I don't think they should have go out of their way to try, try to purposely make it feel different, but that's besides the case. I just don't think that any composer, given four and a half weeks to step in and do it, would have done much better. Not not with that. So let's let him go. Let's let him do another one when he's got actual real amount of time to do it. And then we'll see what he can really do with this universe. We just don't have a big enough sample size. I like Michael Giacchino. Um, I like him a lot. I just The problem, I think, now is he's starting to get overused. They use him. He's done, look at his resume, how many things, mm -hmm. whether it's Apes, Doctor Strange. He's done so many different things. That I th and Star Trek... There's so much that uh, there's only so much someone can do, and then taking on something like Star Wars, and you're absolutely right, four and a half weeks. And I've been probably the most critical of the score at uh, anyone, but four weeks is tough to do. That's really hard to do for anybody. But um, I and I also think that it might not just the Giacchino decision, like you're saying with Lucasfilm, they should have tied in original themes a lot more than a they lot did. More, yeah. So 
I hope that they give, they give him another shot, let him see what he can do with another movie, but I hope it feels like Star Wars, because for me, my biggest problem, I don't think it was, because people have been sending to me, listen to it again, it's a good score. I never said it wasn't a good score. It's not a good score for Star Wars. You listen to it, the guy is a great musician, he's a great composer, he's one of the best. You listen to that alone, yeah, it's a beautiful science fiction score. It's just not Star Wars to me. So I would like him to get another shot, make it more Star Wars-y, if you will, but yeah, of course, he's one of the best, give him a shot. I mean, Giacchino's name is on everything. Giacchino, he's, man, he's, Giacchino! He's like the Kevin Hart of composers. Like, he literally just shows up everywhere possible, and I would... I guess like to see him have a second chance, but I don't think he needs it. I like the music in, in Rogue One. I thought it was really well done. It didn't take me out of the movie. I think I agree with John's point that Lucasfilm was making a conscious effort to separate this movie and the score from what we know from the classic trilogy movies. I was a fan of the score. It did not bother me at all. I liked some of it, as a matter of fact. So I guess give him a second chance, but I don't think he needs it. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Giacchino. Giacchino. G Cappuccino. Yeah, Cuccino. Cappuccino. Giacchino. Look, We've all hit the hard C today. You guys are adding a uh. Uh. Um, Giacchino. 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 Kenny, there what do you go. think about Mikey? <laughs> Mikey. <laughs> Mikey um, G. I, I, if, if they were to do this all over again, obviously time, uh, but that wasn't in their hands. The plot left, and what are you going to do? I mean, can you imagine sitting down for a Star Wars film and having like four weeks to do yeah. that? I, it takes me eight days to write a Crash Course video. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do it again. I think the bigger debate is someone in a group said, let's make this different. And I don't, uh, I understand wanting to say, hey, Rogue One isn't a saga film, but it's still Star Wars. And, I, and it after, ties into the saga. After the yeah. third viewing, I don't necessarily need a crawl, but I needed the Star Wars. I needed the big fanfare yes, to open it, it up. Yes, it and, did. And yes, it did. It did, it did, it did. It needed and, it. And, yeah. and that's not his fault. That was probably someone above. Let's try this. Right. And I don't think you need to try that. Clone Wars, Rebels, those are different. Yeah. And they still feel like Star Wars. I think Wars. the Kevin Kiner score is the best example of Clone Wars and Rebels because it's a perfect blend of new stuff yep. with the William Steam. And when you some of the best video games, we agree, is Knights of the Republic. Mm. Same thing, the way it blends in with yeah. old and new. And it's familiar. And, it, and it, it, I'm telling you, it would have added so much more. It was so jarring. It was yeah, so jarring. Yeah, there was some different stuff. On the third viewing, there's, there's some beautiful pieces of music in it. And again, right. that's like you said, it's still yeah. good. It's good music. It's just, it just you, fit. you, after the first viewing, when you brought it up, I was like, I didn't, I didn't, nothing stood out to me. Oh, wait, nothing stood out to me. Yeah. And now, second and third viewing, uh, there's missed opportunities with it, much like the movie as a whole, which I enjoyed thoroughly, but there were some little missed opportunities. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, too. And, and because uh, there was nothing that I walked out of the theater humming that I hadn't already heard, but I go back to my point is that Star Wars, it's like the Rolling Stones, where I, if they release a new album, I don't, I don't care. I just want to see the great hits that they've been playing for the last 40 years. I don't need a whole lot of new music yes, here. I, I just want something that. that moves the action. I thought it did that really well in this movie. Yes. So here, here's a, this is a great example of how iconic and how dominant Star Wars is. What other movie would we be sitting around for 10 or 15 minutes talking about? But did the score do right. this here, here? But that's, no other but, that's, but that's John Williams. Yes, that's and that's the, yeah. the standard we hold yeah. this thing to. All right, last question of the day. Andrew writes, hey, big fan of the show and the reviews you do. Thanks. Just wondering, do you ever think that they will make any movies based on the canon novels, Lords of the Sith, or even a Palpatine and Plagueis? After Vader is getting so much love in Rogue One, could a spin-off of him happen? Do you think that, or the books will be dark for the movie screen forever? All right, here's the thing. To do one would be a mistake. However, we were just talking about the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, where they, Disney, does have a tendency, I mean, I love Disney. But they do have a tendency sometimes to be like, oh wait, the fans really loved that. Okay, they loved Captain Jack, let's focus the next movie then on Captain Jack. And that was a mistake. I wouldn't put it by Disney to go, okay, you know what, maybe down the road, you know, because we've, we've got planned up to like 2021, 2022. Maybe past that, we should start looking at maybe doing another Darth Vader film. Because the response to him in this movie was so great. But part of the reason it was so great, much like he was used in the original Star Wars, I think Darth Vader is like 10 minutes of screen time in the original yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. 12 or something. You know, 12 he, he's somewhere. the dinosaur from Jurassic Park. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And I think they should not, I don't think they should make a Lords, a Lords of the Sith movie. No, I mean, I love the book. Love it. But I think it's time to move past Lord Vader. I think that I think that was the last time we're going to see him. I think it's the last time we're going to hear James Earl Jones' voice outside of the animated stuff. We might hear him still in there. I think they should move move past it, but I would not put it past them. 
Well, there's there's a couple of things. First, with the novels, it's very tricky to make a movie out of the novels because of the canon thing. Mm -hmm. Because if they make a movie of Lords of the Sith, then the the filmmakers and everyone else they can't change much because yeah, it's because part it's canon because the now. book is canon. So you have to. It, it's it's too tricky. But to do a Vader Emperor movie, that it's it's possible. But I don't think it's going to happen. A standalone Vader movie is something that I'd want to see. But I'm starting to go a different way with it now because I, after rewatching the original trilogy, right? There's two, there's two, the episode four and episode six make me realize Vader could really work in the Obi-Wan movie. And I'll tell you how. Ooh. If you have, if you, if you watch the, in Return of the Jedi, when Luke is trying to turn him back, he's like, Obi-Wan once thought as you did. And then there's also when Obi-Wan was talking to, to Luke where he said, he's, he, he's more machine now than man, twisted and evil. He never, we, what we've seen, we've never seen Obi-Wan acknowledge that he's been in that machine, in the, the suit before. We've never seen that before. And, and Vader talking about how he once thought as you did. Maybe there's a scene in the Obi-Wan movie where they, 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 again, they have to go and they have to fight. And in episode four, it's like, a presence I haven't felt since, but he never says when. So maybe there is one more time when I left you. I was about the, I was about the learner, and maybe they still that was that's the battle that we wanted to see, and you could put it in the Obi Wan movie, and Obi Wan is still the protagonist, and then you have Vader pop in again. It there there are ways to do it. I love your passion, sir. I can't agree with that. Though. I don't care. I <laughs> think you care a little. Oh, that, what, no, I think you, you care didn't, a little. You, you didn't mind. You thought the score was good in Rogue One. So <laughs> I, 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 you're invalid. I, as much as I would like to see Obi Wan and Vader have some sort of showdown in a different universe, I think that it kind of ruins the canon a little bit if you have them face off. I like all of the hints of when he says a presence I haven't felt since. I like that being where it is. I don't. I, and and even Obi Wan saying he's more machine now than man. That's after Obi Wan is a Force ghost who likes to sit sometimes. But he's never seen it though. He's but never if, seen if, him he, if you're a Force ghost, you can probably look at the if action going on. You can sit down as a Force ghost. You, you can, can probably right, see right. Vader. Yes. Yeah. So I think that it, it, without spoiling anything, the way that we got to see Vader in Rogue One, had we not seen. What we saw of Darth Vader in Rogue One, I would agree with you. Seeing what we saw of him in that movie, I think it's a great way to have a proper send-off. A lot like your boy Derek Jeter having a home run in his last at-bat. Right. I mean, look, he did see... I, I don't care! Well, because episode four, <laughs> obviously, he's seen Vader when Vader strikes him down in episode sure. four. He does mm -hmm. see him in, in the yeah. outfit. But it's like, there should be... I don't know, you could do something with it. But I would like to see also, if you're going to do a Vader movie, just stand alone... The Jedi Purge. We never saw because I when people because I know the comments. We've already had a Jedi. We've already had Darth Vader. Episode one, two, three. No, that wasn't a Vader movie. It was an Anakin Skywalker becoming Vader. Vader hunting down the Jedi, watching the Jedi Purge. That would be interesting because who are the Jedi? Jedi are surviving up until Episode four. Kanan's still running around at one point. So all the Jedi and then him taking children of the Force could be interesting. Also. I got it. Vader goes into space to prevent climate controlling satellites. <laughs> From creating a man-made storm of epic proportions Draw while trying to stop the assassination of the President of the United States, Ken. Um, um, I, I'm trying to think of something to wrap this up. I love your fan fiction that you're writing here. I can crawl <laughs> into yeah, that. Yeah. I can crawl into yeah, that. Please do. I want my Obi-Wan in the desert movie, but Rogue One showed me two things. One, I do love Vader, but I like him in small doses right now. And I love his castle. I love, And that castle could come back. I, I, I could see that castle showing up at 8 or 9 because Kylo Ren goes back right. there or something like that. That's all cool. There was that... the little bit of the business meeting scene that I kept joking about, we did get, and I loved it. I loved everything with Vader yeah. in that, other than the don't joke on your own aspirations. Um, uh, but it showed me that, that you, cool you can go, what is your problem? The music's you, good. You can go a little bit too far and kind of uh, demystify the yeah. man that is Vader. Definitely. So it would have to be done very carefully. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, since we're here in New York, let's get let's get everybody over here uh, in front of the camera. You know, we're not the uh, the only guys uh, who came. We pretty much brought the entire yeah. crew. That, Adam, just put that on the wide shot and coming back here. Yeah. Like, Walmart yeah. family photo time. A whole ton of us came down, and you know, there's some some people here you've seen, like Wendy. But a lot of people, like Josh McCuga here. Obviously, you see Mark a lot. Uh, like Wendy's you guys, hands a lot feel of heavy right seen now. Thad. <laughs> That is like one of our, our lead production guys, Dennis. You know, of course, we got some, a lot of our behind Frank the camera. Frank, 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 Frank will not. A lot of our production and endings have Adam and Frank and Cody, and and we're all here in Grace, of course. And so we're going to be doing movie talk uh, from here again tomorrow. But we just wanted to get a chance to try. And there he goes. I was getting ready to shut things down. Everyone wants to get off camera, but we all just want to say uh, thanks for putting up with us that we're not in our studio and doing a live. Once again, we're going to be doing it from here in New York again tomorrow. Tomorrow, but we will we will be back live on Wednesday, right? Yes. We'll be back live on Wednesday. So anyway, thanks for joining us, guys, and until next time, bye-bye.
Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.